And welcome in Lake Kick on the Air. It is Sunday night, June 20th, the year of our Lord, 2021. When I say we're jam-packed, we're jam-packed. And we're going to end the show a little bit different. In fact, a lot different. Director Emeritus Colin, I can't ever remember us ending a show like we're going to tonight. I'll give you more details in just a second. We've got Big Ten swing games tonight. we got blue chip ratio tonight, which essentially is our way, and by our, I mean Bud Elliott's way around here, of narrowing down teams who could possibly win a national title this year. The list is not three or four. It technically is a little bit bigger than that. We're going to talk about that. How about the coaches under the most pressure in college football? I don't do a whole lot of hot seat talk, but we had a submission from Heath, one of our longtime listeners for the Late Kick Extra podcast, and we do the Q&A every Tuesday and Thursday, and he wanted his question answered there. But I said, you know what, Heath, this is a good enough question. And it, we, we can take it many different directions to the point where let's just do it on the Sunday night show. So we're going to answer that. And also, we had such great feedback from our Thursday Late Kick Extra podcast. Again, we do q and it's audio only. So you never hear this on the YouTube channel. You never hear it on Late Kick Live except for this one thing that we're going to do tonight. I had a, a dude named Corbin submit a question, and he asked me, how did Late Kick get to 24-7? Because a lot of you knew of me back in my independent, well, some of you, let me scratch that, some of you knew of me back in my independent days. How did this all happen? And I've never really told that full story. So if you're interested in that, we're not going to leave the show with it. Some of you may not be interested. But if you're interested in that, I'm going to put the entire audio from the podcast that we did the other day, I'm going to put it on the end of tonight's show. So we can have it here on the YouTube channel. If you just watch the uh, live shows on YouTube, you can hear that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of in-depth, but I think there is a lot to be learned from people who do not have a traditional route into whatever industry you're trying to get in. If it's film, if it's college football, if it's accounting, whatever the case may be. Uh, I think, you know, I like to tell that story because I think there's a lot of redeemable quality about it for a lot of people who may be in a similar position to where I was before anyone ever put a microphone in front of my face. So we're doing all that tonight. Thank you so much for, man, giving us a lot of traction. When we say no off season, you guys just confirm it every single week. These numbers are better and better. And a happy Father's Day, by the way. If you didn't give Dad a gift and he likes college football, this link we are providing to you free of charge. Send it out. Let's get this thing done. Let's get the show underway, by the way. So uh, we got a lot to get to and no time to waste. I told you Heath sent a message to us for the Late Kick Extra podcast that I just decided to turn into a full segment on the Sunday night show. And he sent a question in the form of kind of coaches under pressure. And his exact wording was, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much pressure do you think these head coaches are feeling going into the season? And he gave James Franklin, Ed Orgeron, Harbaugh, Clay Helton, Kirby Smart. And there are obviously varying degrees of pressure here, but before we dive in, so I'm going to give an answer to every one of them, I want to make sure we understand there is a big difference in what I would call competitive pressure versus actual job security pressure. Uh, there are some guys here whose jobs are not on the line that could be facing some legitimate competitive pressure. In other words, you look at them and you say, well, I don't, I'm not going to you know, advocate for your firing after this year, but you really need to get this done or that done. So let's, let's just circle the block here. James Franklin, I don't feel a whole lot of pressure with him. Locally, I know there is some uneasiness that obviously comes from a bad year last year, but I think there's also some confidence around the Penn State fan base for anybody who's watched this program, Penn State fan or not. If you've watched the program, you've seen the trajectory they were on, and it was very solid, it was very positive, and then all of a sudden last year happens. So there is, I think, a willingness amongst a lot of Penn State fans and me you know, an outsider to think or maybe believe and buy into the notion of 2020 being a one-off. A lot of programs out there trying to buy into that. Penn State's one of them. Well, here's the thing about 2021. This can change quickly. As much as I say I don't feel the pressure right now, this is not Major League Baseball. They don't play 162 games where you sit there and say, oh, we got to yeah, I mean, we're only 7-13 and 13 over the last 20, but we'll get it right. You don't get to do that in college football. So this could change quick because they open up and they have at Wisconsin, Auburn, Indiana, and at Iowa all in the first month and a half before their bye. And those are all going to be very losable games. They'll be favored in a couple. They'll be an underdog in a couple. But those are all very losable games. And Mike Yurcich, that new offensive coordinator higher up there, let's say he does pan out. Maybe they win all of them. Let's say it's a very mixed result like it was with Kurt Scirocco last year. Well, I'm just wanting, if I'm a Penn State fan, I want to make that game against Ohio State mean something 
in the context of the Big Ten championship race. That's what I'm looking for. So I don't think there's a lot of pressure entering the season, but boy, it could change quickly if you lose, let's say, three of those four games I mentioned. Yeah, it could change quickly. Ed Orgeron, I think there's a lot of pressure on him. But there's also a different element in the room, too, and that's a top-five roster in college football. So there is pressure on him, but it's a little bit hidden right now. You're not going to see it a whole lot between now and week one because the fan base, understandably so, is willing to buy in. They're willing to buy into having two really good options at quarterback. They're willing to buy into a loaded roster, as I said. I mean, they have not taken a back seat to hardly anyone on the recruiting trail. They, being LSU fans, look if you're an LSU fan and you look at your schedule, I could easily see you saying, there's no reason we couldn't be 8-0. Heading into the bye week before Alabama. There's no reason we couldn't be 8-0. Yeah, we're going to UCLA. Vegas says we're only favored by three. Well, I believe we're a lot better. I mean, we're going to play at Mississippi State. We're going to have Auburn in here. We're going to play Florida. But all those are going to be short point spreads. We should be favored. We think we should win because we think everything's going to coalesce this year. We think the offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator hires are going to pan out. We think the locker room synergy is going to be back, which we lacked woefully last year. And if all that comes together, you're going to have to excuse an LSU fan if they think, if all that's in place, we should murder everyone on our way to play Alabama. And uh, listen, I'm not going to go as far as to argue with them. The question marks are that, well, those are question marks. Those are the question marks. A question mark, nine times out of ten, it's a question mark. I want you to remember that. And so... I, don't, I think there is pressure on Ed Orgeron, but they are looking for it to be totally invalidated. But the same people, if they were to have a start to a season like they did last year, those same people, because they're so passionate about that LSU program, they'd be the first ones with the megaphone in front of their mouth. I don't blame them. I'm not making fun of anyone down there. I ac actually understand that line of thinking quite well. How about up at Michigan with Jim Harbaugh? Yes, a lot of pressure here. The whole staff knows it. This is one where I don't think there's a lot of gray area. Everyone kind of understands what the deal is. It's the talk of the Big Ten right now. What's going to happen with the Michigan staff this year? Because they got, they did not get an overwhelming vote of confidence, but they got an extension. You know, they, they, the plank is a little bit longer, and so they get to walk a little bit further out on it again this year. I'm not sure that that's the way that this is going to work for them. What they hope is the other side of that plank is, you know, on solid ground over here, and so we can just walk right over it. At least they're not sitting still, okay? At least they're not up there waiting for the inevitable. They've been active in the transfer portal. We just talked about them picking up another receiver on our previous show. And so they should have as good an explosiveness at the receiver position as they've had since Harbaugh's been there. It's something they've lacked. When Josh Gaddis is named offensive coordinator, it only means what his talent will allow it to mean. And so you, I know you read a lot of these preview magazines and these anonymous coaches saying, oh, they had not really done a whole lot up there. I don't know who's calling the shots offensively. Well, it's, they don't have the talent to call what they want offensively. Maybe they have that now. They got early games uh, against Washington, against Wisconsin on the road. We'll know because, I mean, if they lose those two games – I don't know that there's going to be anything short of a massive upset of Ohio State at the end of the year. I don't know that at that point there's going to be a lot to change the minds of Michigan fans. How about Clay Helton at USC? This is as close to 10, I think, as the pressure cooker gets. I think it's a clear yes. If you ask the fan base, it's a clear yes. But the word clear is the optimal word here. They want clarity. They don't want 8-4. and four. They either want to be 10-2, and 11-1, be in the playoff mix and the Pac-12 championship picture, or they just want to torch the barn, kill the rats, start this whole thing over. And the funny thing about it is, with the lingering questions at Arizona State, a program that many, including myself, thought would be their biggest challenger this year, it, is it just me, or are things setting up out there for Clay Helton and his staff to buy themselves another year? And you talk to some Southern Cal fans and talk to 10 of them, you'll get very mixed reaction on suggesting that. It's kind of counterintuitive. A lot of sports fans wouldn't understand that. But a USC fan looks and they say, we're good, and that's it. And we should be a lot better than good. Kirby Smart, last question here. I think there's competitive pressure on Kirby Smart in no shape, form, or fashion. Will you sell me on the idea that there is job security pressure on him? And if you do try and sell me on it, I'd say, do you believe in championship or bust? Because you've probably been saying something like that. And so you'll probably say yes. And I'll ask, Okay, what if he goes 9-3? and three? I mean, 9-3 and three would be worst case for Georgia this year. 
Kirby Smart goes nine and three. What's happening to him? You tell me he's getting fired? Kirby Smart's not getting fired if he goes nine and three? That's not happening. So this is competitive pressure. Because if he goes nine and three, oh, everyone would be dunking on him. You know, his own staff internally, they would be crushed if they went nine and three. They're not getting fired if he goes nine and three. That's why I haven't said the terms or the phrase, I guess, championship or bust, because I don't believe that's the situation they're in. Rarely is anyone ever in that situation. But I think there's a healthy amount of competitive pressure there, as there should be, and as I, I, as a result, I don't have a problem with that. But job security pressure, no. I don't think there is that for Kirby Smart. Let's roll it on here. We've been doing swing games. So we did the SEC, both divisions. We did the ACC. Tonight, Big 10 swing games. By swing game, to remind you of what our definition is, it's not always your biggest game, but it's the game that's going to be the most pivotal in determining how your season goes. Let's start with Ohio State. They play at Indiana in week eight. A lot of focus on the quarterback position for Ohio State, but a lot of focus for people who really, really follow the program on a day-to-day -day basis is on defense. Mine too. I'm looking at defense. I got all the confidence in the world. Quarterback's going to be really good for him. C.J. Stroud, I don't have any questions about him, and we've never even seen him start a game before. It's defense where you have the question. So you look up and down their schedule, and you ask yourself, well, where will we get the answers to those questions? It could be at Indiana in week eight. It could be that you have to wait that long. Ohio State's off a bye. You will certainly have their full focus because of what almost happened in this game last year. And this is where a potential championship team should start to hit its stride. It's not week two or week three. You're not ironing out the, the wrinkles in your team anymore. This is time. This is time to hit your stretch run. So I'm going to go add Indiana for Ohio State in week eight. What about Penn State? Several options here. We could go with the Wisconsin game to open the year. They got Auburn in there in week three. They got Indiana a couple of weeks later. That Man, you look at the schedule. Those are three very tight conference games before the bye. And at Iowa is the last one. They go to Iowa, wild swing here. And what could be the outcomes before we get to this game. But even independent of what happens, I don't think Penn State's going to lose all of their losable games before this. This could be where the season turns. They could head into that by 2-4. and four. They could head into it 6-0. and oh. All those outcomes are going to be on the table. This trip to Iowa, though, it's a loaded week for college football. Week 6 is a loaded week. And this trip to Iowa is going to be a big one for Penn State. For Iowa, it's the same game. I'm picking the Penn State at Iowa game as the swing game for both of these programs. Iowa's got Indiana and at Iowa State. Those are the first two games of the year. Then they're going to be off your radar for a while. And then they're going to reemerge. This is their big home statement opportunity. This is, again, in week six. It's the only time I think that they'll be an underdog aside from the Wisconsin game for the rest of the year. So by this point, obviously, we think we will know what we have with Iowa I mean, certainly, if you look at the scheduling for all the world, this will be a must-win sort of do-or-die mode, maybe for both programs when it comes to chasing a spot in Indianapolis in the Big Ten title game. How about Michigan? I picked the Indiana game. Indiana at Michigan. It's in Week 10. There are a lot of choices here, too. Gave strong consideration to that Washington game in Week 2, only because Michigan's one of those teams that really needs a fast start. And they're going to be one of those teams that's doubted and you don't know what you have at quarterback. And so there's going to be a big referendum in week two when Washington comes in there. I think a lot of people, when they saw that hypothetical point spread and they saw Washington is probably going to open as a small favorite, they said, are you serious right now? A Pac-12 team, not even the favorite out there, is coming in here. They're going to be favored in the big house. It, it's just Fred Sanford. It hurts a little bit. It should. I think that's a big game. That's not the one I'm circling. I'm circling the Indiana game. I had a hiccup. Hmm. I think pounding my chest gave me a hiccup there. It's a totally different offense. This is why I'm picking the Indiana game. All these other offenses Michigan will have faced to this point, uh, you know, they kind of come from the same mold to varying degrees. This Indiana team, totally different, though. And this Indiana game is sandwiched in the worst possible place. It's sandwiched between a road trip to Michigan State and a road trip to Penn State. And you got Indiana thrown right there in the middle. We ran the numbers on this. I would project this as a pick em point spread right now. Very competitive game and um, not the most opportune spot to put it on the schedule. How about Wisconsin? Speaking of Michigan, I picked the Michigan game as Wisconsin's biggest swing game in week five. 
It's that end of the very tough kind of opening month or five weeks for Wisconsin. We've talked about this stretch. Now, they're all home games, but they got Penn State to open. They got Notre Dame coming in there, and they got Michigan. They should be favored in every one of those games. Well, the Notre Dame game is a neutral site game, so there's not a true road game inside any of those. But it's going to let us know where they stand. I mean, not just this one game against Michigan, but this is the final game in that stretch. And we will certainly know. You know, I'm one, for instance, who believes that Wisconsin's offense is going to pleasantly surprise some people. Well, if it does through this stretch of games, you look out for them. They could be a bowling ball through the rest of their schedule. And finally, Indiana at Penn State, week five. Very easy game to pick for me. It'll be a game of the year type situation for Indiana. I know they got Ohio State later on down the road, but this is one you talk about bright red Sharpie circling this thing. You remember how this ended last year, how we looked at the box score, and it seemed impossible Penn State could have lost, but the scoreboard said otherwise. It's the second tough road spot for Indiana. I, do you end up going in there and making them outscore you in their own house? Talking about Penn State. Do you go into Penn State? and end up making them outscore you. Because that's kind of what it turned into last year at Indiana. I wonder if they can turn that same thing in Happy Valley. Those are our Big Ten swing games for this year. Now we just switch gears entirely. i got to talk to you about some recruiting. So on Monday, Bud Elliott releases his most popular feature of the year on 247sports.com. It's the blue chip ratio. And I plan to talk about it Thursday. Then Arizona State made things go haywire. So we pushed it to Sunday. That's the good thing about the blue chip ratio. It doesn't change a whole lot once you release it. What I like about the blue chip ratio is it dispels the notion of a Cinderella in college football. A lot of you want to expand the playoff because you want to give a shot to a Cinderella. Cinderellas don't win national titles in this sport. They could win a playoff game. Notice the difference. We're not talking about teams capable of making the playoff, four teams or 12 teams. We're talking about teams capable of actually winning a national championship. There are no Cinderellas in college football. We'll define that in a second. College basketball does not equal college football. It's apples to bowling balls. No comparison. So Bud releases this thing. Very simple premise. It's brilliant in its simplicity. You establish what is the minimum recruiting level you have to be at over a four-year period to win a national championship. So you look across the, across the span of history, and you set your parameters, and you mine the data, and you find what is that baseline. And it turns out that in order to win a national championship throughout the entire history of whatever the metrics are that have been available, your roster, in the recruiting era, let's say, your roster has to have a higher percentage of four- and five-star talent than it does three-star talent and less for four consecutive years up until the point that you take the measurement. So the 2021, 20, 19, and 18 classes really is what we're looking at here. You just have to have signed more four- and five-star talent than the two- and three-star talent. Now, here's what I want to do. Okay, I know you got a lot of questions, so I want to reveal the list, and then we'll come back to it. So here is the list. Now, you may have been expecting four teams, eight teams. There are 16 teams here. Now, this list, let's provide some context. In and of itself, the list doesn't mean anything. Being on this list does not guarantee you a single win. Not being on the list, history says, guarantees that you will not win a national title this year. Bama has the highest blue chip ratio in the history of the BCR this year, 84%. A couple of takeaways here. I saw that Florida sits right there at number eight. That is good, man. That's good for Dan Mullen because the perception is they don't recruit well. No, they recruit very well. I always try and provide this backdrop. When we're talking Florida, when we question their recruiting, we're only questioning it against the top 1% of the sport because they recruit better than like 97 or 98% of the sport. I know I got a little loose with the math there. Florida has the eighth highest blue chip ratio in America right now. And this is Dan Mullen's team. He's not a first-year coach. He's been there a while. They're sitting there, Florida, dead even with Texas, Oklahoma, and LSU. So I really guess it's a tie for fifth. Florida stands out, okay? Another thing that stands out is this explains the pressure on Ed Orgeron because they are sitting there, again, tied for the fifth highest blue chip ratio, which means you've got the adequate talent there, more than adequate, to win a championship. I think Oklahoma stands out, also tied for fifth. I'm excited to see the next time they're on the field in a playoff situation 
or what you may call a meaningful bowl game, I'm excited to see them against an SEC team again. I wish I could put them on the field with Georgia again this year or put them on the field with LSU again this year or put them on the field with Alabama again this year. You may predict the same outcome, but if you get it, the team that ends up beating them handedly will have done it against a much better Oklahoma roster top to bottom than they faced in 2019 or 2018 or, or whenever that was before that. And also look at Oregon, just surge. Oregon is now sitting there in 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th place, a tie for 12th. And that is the only team other than USC that's out on the West Coast or anywhere close to the West Coast that's on this list. And Oregon does not have the benefit of being parked in Southern California and they have surged. The Oregon Ducks have surged, and they will not go anywhere but up on this list. So an important note here, again, being on the list doesn't guarantee you anything, but it is a parameter. It's a prerequisite. If you're not on the list, then it does mean something. It means history says you will not win a national championship this year. Now, I know the takeaways, so I'm going to save you some time. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to save you some time. If you're headed to the comment section right now, you're probably tempted to say one of the following things. What about three stars? Are you saying three stars never pan out? What about this guy in the NFL draft or that former two star? Uh, no, I'm not saying that at all. First off, according to our rating system, a three star player is a very good player. Somewhere along the lines get, that got misinterpreted. A three star player is a very good player. What we are talking about is not a case by case. Any overwhelming rule that you develop in life or in college football recruiting, you will always be able to cherry pick exceptions to those rules. I would recommend you don't look at this thing with a magnifying glass right there at ground level. I would suggest you zoom it out and you go 50,000 feet and you view it strictly in the aggregate. In the aggregate, this balances out. Star ratings win in the aggregate. You look at the NFL draft numbers and how overwhelmingly more favorable you have in terms of chances of being a first-round draft pick if you're a five-star high school player or being a draft pick if you're an All-American, if you're a four-star or five-star high school player. Point being, yes, there are exceptions. View it in the aggregate, and it really carries a lot of weight. You also may be saying, well, development's really what matters, not the star rating. No, both of them matter. Development only matters if you've got an edge in development and the talent is otherwise equal. Or maybe you're going against a more talented team, but they don't develop well and you do. But here's the problem. Remember the context. We're talking about trying to win a championship. When you're trying to win a championship, you're eventually going to run up on Clemson or Alabama or Ohio State. Those places are loaded with talent and they're A-plus at developing it. So you have to be close to on par with them, talent-wise, to compete with them. Not make an 11 seed in a 12-team playoff. Win a championship. That's what we're talking about here. And so again, if you properly interpret recruiting rankings, then this makes sense. But as sure as I say that, I'll get in the comment section and I'll have some of the things that I just mentioned pop up. But I really think this is fun. If you want to find this, head over to 247sports.com. It's still there. Uh, if it's not on the front page, Google blue chip rating, and you'll find it very, very quickly. Okay, a different, different turn here that I want to take on the show than we normally do. On the Late Kick Extra podcast on Thursday, which we release every Tuesday and Thursday morning, you can find the Late Kick podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We release a product on Tuesday and Thursday that's audio only. You don't see it on the YouTube channel. And I take Q&A. It's all mailbag. And so Corbin submits a question, and he said, how did Late Kick get to 24-7? Essentially, what he was talking about is, at once upon a time, you were independent. You had your own YouTube channel. And then all of a sudden, you're here. And I've shared bits and pieces of that, but I've never really told that story. And so I chose to just carve out some time at the end of the podcast, just like we are at the end of the show. And we got such overwhelming feedback on it. I mean, by the time the day was over, dozens and dozens of you, I don't, maybe hundreds, had submitted emails or DMs and said, I love that story. Tell more of those. So I figured we ought to put this on the YouTube channel because a lot of you just watch the show here and you don't listen to the podcast. And so I wanted to give you a chance to hear this. A lot of you are going to be interested in this. And I think there's a lot to be taken away from it, even if you're not in sports media. You know, if you just like the show, but maybe, you know, you drive trucks for a living. There's a lot, I think, to be learned from the atypical path that some of us, myself included, had to take to rise up to, you know, any kind of relative stature in the sports media industry. So this is the exact audio from our Thursday Late Kick Extra podcast. Take a listen. 
Corbin submits the question. He said, would you be able to give a summary of your broadcasting career on the podcast or just in an email reply? I hear you often drop a reference here and there of different places you've been. I was just curious how you got into broadcasting, where did you start, how did you get involved with CBS and 24-7, and how do you have the platform you currently enjoy? I appreciate this question. One day probably I'll be able to just do an hour speaking circuit version of this because I think my story is very fun. I think it's very valuable, though. It's valuable because it doesn't matter if you don't have a lick of talent in the world of media. you got talent somewhere. You need to figure out what it is. You need to figure out where it overlaps with your passion and just draw a circle there and find how many careers you can isolate in that little intersection, that circle around the intersection of talent and passion. It should be the focus of everyone's life. You didn't get your talent yourself. Someone gave it to you. It was put inside you. It's there to be used. It's not there to just bottle up and only use in your spare time or use as a hobby or don't use at all. And your passion's the same way. It's very beautiful because everyone's unique in that way. No one has the exact combination of talent and passion that you do. And yet we got a lot of people in our business and in our world that try and emulate others where you're not designed to be anyone else. You're designed to be yourself. So anyway... My reason for saying that is I didn't get that for a long time. And so I looked elsewhere for inspiration. Inspiration's fine. I'm not saying I haven't been inspired by people, but I was looking to other people as a model of how I should live or how I should approach my career. That's not the way to do it. You can take guidance. You can draw hints and clues, but there's something in you that's not in them. And there's something in them not in you. So in a lot of ways, it really becomes a waste of time to do that. I'll tell you what happened. I was working construction, Knew I didn't want to do it the rest of my life. Learned a lot of lessons there, though. Ended up in a fabric warehouse, non-air conditioned, this time of year especially. That's just torturous in Georgia. And um, I would listen to sports talk radio every single day. That was the day. You get in, you unload the Southeastern freight truck, you listen to Colin Cowherd at that time at ESPN Radio, you get to lunch, you get back in, you got whatever show on ESPN Radio happens in the afternoon. Then there was an afternoon drive show. And then that's the end of the day. I mean, that was my entire day. I just listened to Sports Talk Radio all day. Loved it. Always had been enamored with it. Thought I had a little bit of talent and skill enough to do it. Had no clue how to do it. I didn't have a dad who worked at a radio station. I didn't have a mom who was an accountant in Bristol, Connecticut at ESPN. I didn't have a cousin who owned his own conglomerate of local TV stations. I had nothing. I had no contacts. I had no relationships. I didn't have the college degree at the time necessary. I'm going to say necessary loosely. I thought it was necessary, Uh, but I knew I wanted to do it. I just didn't know how. So I sat in that sample department in that warehouse for a couple of years, and that was my day every day, not getting any younger. And so the local radio show that was there in Columbus was called The Press Box. It was hosted by a guy named Bobby Z. He had been a big-time FM DJ in several of the big markets, Houston most notably. Uh, But he loved sports, and so he came to Columbus to do sports talk radio. And so I would listen every day. I listened for about a year. And I finally got up the nerve to email him or Facebook message him, I think. And I said, can I just come in and watch the show? I've never seen it before. I've never been in a studio. I didn't expect to get an answer. And I got an answer really quick. He said, yeah, come on in. And I started to come in. And I brought in some of my demo material, some of my real material. And all that is, for those unfamiliar, is you get yourself in a studio or just put a microphone in front of you, record yourself, boom, you got a demo reel. Hopefully it sounds decent enough. And so I gave it to him. I didn't know if he had listened to it or not, but I got to sit in the radio station and I got to see production happen for the first time. I got to see how you pod someone up when they're coming in. I got to see how you provide audio beds when you're going to do a produced segment. I got to see how call structure was formatted. I got to see how you hit your hard ends and hard outs. I got to see all that stuff. And so it was great because unbeknownst to myself, I had always observed instead of just listened and watched. I'd always observed, and so a lot of it made sense. You didn't have to tell me twice why you were doing something. Well, a few weeks go by, and his co-host gets sick one day, and I can come in there, and I can just watch and watch and watch until all of a sudden I get told, hey, pun's not in today. Can you hop on air? And I said, yes, I can. It was the middle of football season, and we took calls for three hours, highlight of my life, thought it was the only time I was ever going to be able to do it. We wrap up the show. He says to me, that was a good job. I thought we were going to crash and burn. We didn't. It was a really good job. Appreciate you hopping in on a moment's notice. Where'd you say you would work before? I said, I've never worked before. He thought I was lying to him because I did a good enough job on air that he thought 
I had made that up. He thought I had been somewhere else and I just came in there and I was lying about not having experience. Don't know what sense that would make, but he thought I was lying. I said, no, I've never worked anywhere. I've never been in media anywhere. And I never got taken off the air again. I was given a permanent spot there. It was a three-man booth when I was in there because the co-host came back, Punk came back, and I was still in there. And so we had some fun, man. It was so blazing hot in that studio because there was no air circulation. Uh, probably an OSHA violation, but we didn't report it because we were getting to do Sports Talk Radio. And they actually paid us a little bit of money to do it, too. Legendary shows. Very, very much flying in the face of what FCC regulations typically allow you to do. But we were just enough off the radar where it didn't matter there in Columbus, Georgia. But that's a big break. But I'll tell you where an even bigger break came. And I tweeted this out today, actually. And it was sort of inspired by knowing I was going to talk about this. I'm recording in the evening. And so you're listening to this the next day. But I knew I was going to talk about this tonight, so I tweeted it out earlier today. I said, the best advice you can ever have, in this line of work especially, is to treat every day like a job interview. This is not a classical situation. Sports media, media in general, it's not a classic situation. If you're in performance-based art in general, you do not get hired because of your job interview or your resume or your college degree. You get hired based on whether you can produce or not. I've interviewed for radio now, TV, and 24-7 and CBS. No one ever even asked me where I went to school. They didn't care. They had already seen what they needed to see. So my next big break is tied right into that. I'm sitting at home one day. I get a phone call. Phone call is from a general manager at a TV station there in Columbus. He said, you don't know this. But I've been listening to you every day driving home for about a month now. I get off work about the time you're on radio. Me and the sales team over here, we got an idea. We want to do a five-night-per-week live college football call-in show on TV. You want to do it? I said, yeah, I think I do. And so I start at WLTZ there in Columbus, Georgia. Ended up being the sports anchor there, too, and the sports director in time. Uh, not qualified, to be blatantly honest with you. Co-workers knew I wasn't qualified. There may have been a little bit of animosity. I don't blame them one bit. Over time, those people became my best friends. So what happened was I finally got to do TV. Had never done it before. Never, never, never. Had never been in a TV studio. The first time I was ever in a TV studio, I was on live TV. First time I ever read a teleprompter or looked at a camera or did a transition three shot to one shot. I was on TV live. Didn't get any practice. It, it was rough for a little while. And that was just the sports anchoring portion. Formatting and blocking and producing the actual college football show, that was a whole bigger chore in and of itself. But we grew that thing over time. We had a really hardcore audience there in Columbus. Uh, you'd call them a P1 audience if you're in radio. But they are diehard. They're there every night. We were hitting at 10 o'clock on the D2 channel, the CW channel there. But we had viewers, and we did pretty good. And so we keep doing that and keep doing that. A couple of years go by, I got a, a buddy named Jonathan Rivers that I co-hosted the show with. Uh, some of the most fun times we ever had. We were also, just to get extra practice in, doing an extra Friday night three-hour radio show over at WCUG, The Cougar, on the corner of 9th and Broad. It's the Columbus State University radio station. I, I had a large part in helping to build and format that entity entirely. We were some of the first programming. Uh, especially long-form live programming that they ever played there. And so Jonathan and I, we do that show at, at WLTZ for a little while, Football Nightly Down South. Never forget that name as long as I live. And one day, I'm looking on my phone or just on my laptop, and I'm on Facebook, and I see a Facebook live stream. Never seen it before. It was a brand-new feature. YouTube Live wasn't around yet. I saw a Facebook live stream, and you know how – Sometimes you hear people tell stories about the past and they say, I knew the second I saw this, or I knew the second I saw that. Most of the time it's BS. Most of the time the big realizations in your life, they don't happen just like that. They happen over time. Well, friends, this is one of the very few realizations that it took me a microsecond to realize. I knew the second I saw a Facebook live stream, the entire world was changing. I knew I needed to change my entire world. I knew... That's where the future is. That is how I take what I want to be a national voice and a national approach to college football and actually reach the masses with it. Here is how big you can't understand unless you're in media how big this was. This was a Berlin Wall moment in sports media. The two main roadblocks that would stand between myself or anyone else even remotely in my shoes and making it nationally 
were overhead and distribution. It's why we idolized Sports Center anchors or ESPN radio hosts growing up. There were so few of them, and we viewed them almost in a deified manner because they were somewhere that you probably can never get because of overhead and distribution. Overhead meaning you need massive studios and massive infrastructure. And then more importantly, really, the second part is distribution. How are they taking your product and getting it to someone in Tupelo, Mississippi and Salem, Oregon at the same time? It used to be called syndication, and it still is. That was the only way. And then all of a sudden, we've got the largest social platform on the face of the earth. There were already several billion people on Facebook at the time. And you're telling me that platform has a live streaming mechanism? You cannot possibly understand how big that was. I mean, I didn't sleep for nearly a week just, just envisioning what that could be. So here's what I started to do. I don't know if footage of this still exists, but here's what I started to do. I had been promoted to news anchor since that point. So I'm news anchoring. I'm anchoring the 6 o'clock news. When we get off air, I take my jacket off. I go in our control room because it looks really cool. A lot of buttons and monitors and it looks like a NASA space station in Houston. And so I start taking my cell phone and just doing Facebook Live videos and doing college football the way I want to do it. And management catches on about a week into that. General manager calls me into his office and says, what is this? Uh, I say, that's just something I'm doing on the side. He said, well, it looks to me like you're doing it in my control room. And it looks to me like you're on the clock here. So it's on company time. And it doesn't look like I could stand to make a dime from this. So what point is there in letting you do this? And I didn't have a rebuttal. Of course, he's right. He's not saying anything I wouldn't say if I were in his shoes. But man, that lit a fire under me because I, for the first time, shifted from thinking that was a golden opportunity I had to a place that I was stuck. So I had about a year left on my contract at that point. I took the next year to plan and plan and plan. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew exactly how I wanted to do it. I learned YouTube in that year. And I learned that I wanted to be a multi-platform streaming product that I owned. It comes time to negotiate contract. I get called into the news director's office with a general manager. They offer to extend me several years. It would have been really good money. I mean, unheard of money for me at the time. And I declined it because it was not going to include the opportunity to produce my own show that I owned on my own platform. And it was just not something that they were going to bend on. And so we stalemated. Uh, my contract's coming up. I have not renewed. And it looks like we're just going to say all's well that ends well. We go our separate ways. One day before my contract expires, I get called back in and they had essentially been sweating me. And so it didn't work because I had no intention of re-signing if I could not do what I wanted to do. And so I get called back in and they said, what is the deal? I'm like, What do you have lined up? I said, I didn't have anything lined up. And that was the truth. I didn't have anything lined up. I was going to go somewhere and start a YouTube channel. That's what I was going to do. I was that confident in the vision I had. I had no guarantee. I mean, I was broke already. And so they said, what can we do here? I mean, we got to figure something out. We cannot let you, as a salaried employee, do what you want to do. And so we figured out a workaround. I offered to work 1099 status for them, fractions of the money they would have paid me. I'm not employed, so you don't have to give me benefits. I'll still be your news anchor, but here's what I want in return. I want an hour of studio time, three nights a week, and the ability to bring my own crew in here. And we want to film live a YouTube college football show and they agreed to it very quickly they agreed to it they made sure the studio time was blocked off and they agreed to it and thought that they had kind of one up to me there they hadn't they just didn't know it yet so I was making no money really do I was making 50 or 75 dollars per newscast if you want to do the math on that and uh I but we started our show we built our own set we had to build it every night we had to wheel it in there and wheel it out of there every night and we did that show, and we called it Late Kick Live with Josh Pate, the exact same name it's got now. And we did it on YouTube just like it's done now. And we started to grow that subscriber base, and we reached the necessary benchmarks to monetize that thing. And over the span of about eight months, I was making more on that YouTube channel than I had been making at the news station. And a year in, I was making more than I would have been making on salary there. I was on top of the world, man. I was so happy because it paid off. I mean, it, it looked like there was legitimate traction. I mean, we were getting some attention. LSU put us in their hype video the week before they played Bama in 2019. Here was the kicker, though. Since I was still associated with the news station, 
I could get credentialed to games under WLTZ's name. And so I could go shoot my own B-roll. See, the big roadblock for a lot of content creators is they don't have rights and licensing to any video. They don't have elements to use. I was able to do a workaround because I could be credentialed to games and go shoot my own footage and have my own library of B-roll. And it gave me a huge leg up, as did being able to produce a show on YouTube out of a full working TV studio. Could literally have never guessed what was about to happen. November of 2019, show's doing really good. We are really, really high on LSU ahead of time. It pays off. We're riding a wave of momentum. We're starting to get traction. We're starting to be seen enough by college football diehards that it's on people's radars. And I get a call in November of 2019 from Shannon Terry, who was, as you know, the CEO of 24-7 Sports at the time. I let it go to voicemail. I didn't recognize the number. I thought it was spam. It's probably a story I'll tell until the end of time. Yeah, I noticed the name pretty quick on the voicemail, so I call him back. He said, in not so many words, he said, I know that you don't realize this, but we've been watching you. I've been watching your stuff for about a month and a half or two months. I can't believe you're, once he heard my story, he said, I can't believe you're able to pull that off. You shouldn't be able to pull that off, but I want you to come pull it off here. We don't even know fully what we want you to do. Whatever you're going to do, I want you doing it here. I want you to come here and create for us at 24-7 and CBS. And so I talked with him for about the next two weeks. We worked a contract out, and I got here in January of 2020. And sure enough, everything I was promised has been followed through on. I was given full naming rights, full creative control over my show, full production, executive production status of my show. No one to this point in time at 24-7 or CBS has ever stepped in and told me a thing to put on that show. They've never told me a thing to take out of the show. They've never told me not to do anything on the show. So I want you to think about that two-year swing. You're going from being one day away from being unemployed to two years later, one of the biggest media companies on planet Earth handing you the keys to their resources and saying, hey, why don't you come here and we'll triple whatever you were making. And by the way, all you have to do all day is talk about college football. I knew. The moment I got here, if we could ever just make sure we can get the product in front of enough people, I thought you guys would love the show because it was going to be your show. That's all it's ever been about. That's all it's ever been intended to be. But without that distribution, without the ability to get your product out, it's kind of like, you know, yelling in a forest, but there's no one around to hear it. You can do the best job in the world if you don't know how to market and get your product out there. It can be rendered irrelevant a lot of times, but we've gotten it in front of you. And it's taken off even to a greater extent than we thought. And I had some pretty lofty goals for it. But you guys have blown away every goal that I had for our stuff when we came here. And let me tell you what you've done. I talk about this a lot. I tell you as much as I can tell you and maybe a little bit more than I can tell you. But we get about a year in and all of a sudden the calls you start getting are from CBS Sports and from executives that have been all over the media industry. And the ones handling your contract negotiations for your next round, they're right at the top of the totem pole. And you got family and friends that support you back home, constantly hear from them, and it feels really good. But let me tell you the bigger feeling I have, and I'll wrap it up after this because this has probably gone on like 30 minutes. The biggest feeling I have and the biggest source of excitement is last year wasn't normal. We got here and we started that show on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel in the middle of March. And then we went into lockdown, and then we didn't know if we were going to have a season. And it was an election year, so everyone's attention was fragmented. We got fractions of a season. We did not have full investment emotionally from the college football public because there was a lot going on last year. And still, the show was an overwhelming success. So what happens now, a year in, we have refused to take an offseason. We just won't do it. And now we're heading headlong in towards a season where everything returns to normal. If even normal turned up to 11 on the volume scale, we've got a fully established product. We've got great distribution channels. We've got great listenership and viewership. We've got new production hires that will be made public eventually uh, that really just add new dynamics and layers to the show. What happens when all that comes together? Well, we're going to make it the biggest college football show in the country. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make it the best in the country. We are very appreciative. I'm very appreciative, very humbled, very honored and blessed to have the opportunity. We'll never take it for granted, have never taken it for granted, a day in my life. But now that the opportunity is there, we're going to grab it by the throat. 
there will be none better out there than what we give you this fall. There will not be a college football product on planet Earth that's better than what we give you with Late Kick this fall. So, Corbin, that's an up-to-date picture of the old broadcast career. Let me add one more thing in there because one of the other huge blessings you have when you can work for a major organization like this is we can keep the content free. I can keep Late Kick free. I don't have to charge you. I am not bemoaning anyone who has to charge for their content. Please don't misunderstand me. If you're working in the independent world, you have to get by by any means necessary. That's why I'm referring to it as a blessing that we get to produce for free. The only thing, the only thing I ask of you guys is follow that Twitter account, at Late Kick Josh. Follow that Instagram account, at Late Kick Josh. Make sure you're subscribing to the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel and liking those videos. The likes really help. Commenting really helps. But let me tell you what means the most to me. When I see you guys tweeting out, as I've said before, screenshots that you're listening to the podcast or you're watching the show and you tag me in them, I try and retweet as many of them as I can. We get dozens and dozens and dozens per day. That is what means the world because it is the way that this kind of show should be marketed. I don't want to go to the CBS ad executive folks and say, hey, we need $75,000 in our marketing Q1 budget because we need to manufacture excitement for the show. That's not the way I've ever successfully been marketed to. It probably doesn't work for you either. But if you see one of your buddies voluntarily on their Instagram story or their Twitter account put out evidence that they're listening to a show, late kick, cover three, whatever the case may be, that's how you get me. And that's how we grow this show. We're not spending a dime marketing this show. We're not marketing it anywhere. We're counting on you. That's how we've grown this show. That's how we'll continue to grow the show. So that's what I ask you guys to do. Tell your buddies. Tell your friends. Put it out there on your IG accounts and your Twitter accounts. We do that. We will have everything that we want to have with this show. So that was fun. I mean, we tell stories there occasionally. It's 90% college football, but sometimes we mix in a 10% of other that's what we get when you drive the show. It's Q&A for a reason. Thank you so much for watching Late Kick Live tonight. Thank you for the five-star reviews if you listen in the podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and click like. That little thumbs up on all these videos, that really helps us. We're doing really good, guys. We're, we're doing phenomenal numbers, so all I'm asking you to do is just keep it up. We keep this show free. Everyone's happy. For Director Emeritus Colin, for our entire crew in Fort Lauderdale, I'm Josh Pate. Have yourselves a great start to the week. Again, happy Father's Day, and God bless.